Well, good evening. Well, good evening. And if you're with my guest, it's good morning. Um, so welcome everyone to another session of Open Minded and another amazing person is joining us tonight. And from the UK, we have Poppy Jarman, OBE. And a uh, kindred spirit for me, an internationally respected mental health advocate, national policy advisor, and social entrepreneur, a global voice of authority on workplace mental health. And she's the CEO of City Mental Health. And we're going to get into the City Mental Health Alliance. And we're going to get into this because this is her little baby and has done amazing work around the world. Also, a director of Rebalance and a trustee for the Center of Mental Health. So Poppy was the founding CEO of Mental Health First Aid. So you've heard about Mental Health First Aid. So now we're going to talk to one of the founders in England. Under her leadership, the organization developed from a small government project into a fast growing, commercially successful community interest company recognized by the FT in 2017 of one of the fastest growing SMEs in Europe. She also served two terms on the advisory board of Public Health England. Poppy, you and I have spoken a few times. Thank you for joining me. I know it's seven o'clock here in New Zealand and eight o'clock in the morning in the UK. So firstly, how are you? Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm really excited to be in here on here or with you, JK. I've seen I've listened to most of these podcasts and I think they are absolutely brilliant. So it was a real honor to be invited to have a chat with you this morning. Well, the honor's all mine, and and you have a you have a fantastic story. But can you tell me a little bit about your background and why you you have such a passion for this? Because you really um, your upbringing, growing up in Portsmouth as a third generation British Bangladeshi woman, you've mentioned how those formative years, in hindsight, likely led you on a path of working into mental health. But you also have your own personal journey. So where does this passion for change come from? Yeah, absolutely, JK. So look, I, you know, I, I and I, I, you know, one of the things I do want to talk about today is about identity and the impact of not feeling a sense of belonging. And I think being a migrant, um, you know, coming from a migrant family in this country, it had its imprints, as, uh, which were amazing in some senses, the opportunities, the, uh, yeah, the, the, the changes that we as a family could make, and I as an individual could make, I probably wouldn't have had that if I had grown up in Bangladesh, but where I was born. But at the same time, it leads some negative scars as well, because your sense of belonging is often disrupted um, when you move from one place to another and actually you grow up in a completely different setting and you're a brown woman and all of those things. But my journey with mental health started in my uh, late teens, early 20s when um, and it was with the birth of my first daughter, actually. So. I got diagnosed with postnatal depression. And at that time, JK, I had no idea what mental illness was. Like I, yeah, apart from what you see on the, on the media and, you know, the way that people talk about it. And this is, you know, I'm 44 years old, so we're going back, <laughs> we're going back 24 years. In fact, we celebrated my daughter's 25th birthday this weekend, just gone. I feel very old, but. Um... <laughs> know how you feel know how you feel <laughs> kind of creeps up on you doesn't it a little bit you say look at them and think how did you get this big and an adult and working and <laughs> yeah, yeah anyway. and i still in my head i still feel the same i think that we we should touch on that later because um you feel your age through your children so i know exactly how you feel i've got 25 27 25 and 22 so yeah yeah it's it's fascinating but so, so I was diagnosed with postnatal depression and I genuinely thought that my life was over because I had the same stigmatizing views of mental illness that most people in society have. You know, you, you look around you and we've got a word in Bengali called pagal, which, or fagal, which depending on which dialect you're speaking. And it basically means mad person in a very derogatory way. And I kind of figured that was me. That was, that was, that was, you know, the end of whatever life I had, but actually 
I went on a massive learning journey and guided by my health visitor. So we have health visitors here where, you know, when you've had a baby, they look after you, they're a nurse. And she was Chinese, actually. And I think the fact that she herself was from a ethnically diverse or ethnic minority, she understood the cultural nuances, the differences that wasn't set completely in the medical profession and was able to support me and guide me towards getting help. So she ensured that I went to my GP. We talked about this. I got on, got on medication. She helped teach me relaxation techniques um, and gave me hope most of all. And that was crucial in those really early stages of feeling unwell and recovering from from my mental illness but i think the thing that really changed my world was getting a job and and i'll i'll come back to that in a moment because as I was grappling with all the struggles of, you know, what is, who am I? Am I going to be a fit mother? Is this baby going to be taken away from me? Because actually that's what happens when you're not well and when you're not fit. Should I tell my GP the full truth of how I'm feeling? Because at times those feelings were suicidal. You know, what would happen to me? What would happen to her? And what I really when I went into therapy, I found that therapy was not actually helpful. The first therapist I went to, and the reason why that was, was my therapist was quite young and she didn't really understand the cultural differences that I was coming from. So, for example, at the time I was in a arranged or forced marriage um, and I was living in a massive extended family scenario and my therapist didn't really get why I was in that situation. She didn't really understand why I was conforming in the way that I was or struggling to conform. And so I spent quite a lot of time like educating her and bless her, she did her best, but I just thought I'm not getting anywhere here. So you I'm became the therapist. <laughs> Yeah, I became I became her educator, which really is not what you need when you're no, in therapy. No, <laughs> yeah. you're looking for so many answers. You don't you do not need to start teaching the therapist about, you know, cultural differences and wow. Yeah. And so and then on the flip side of that, like my mum was so worried and my family of obviously, you know, I'm I'm the eldest daughter. They were just what's happening, I guess, feeling the same level of stigma as a, you know, and not having the education around mental health. And at the time, again, there wasn't a lot of literature in in Bengali language, which is my mum's first language. So there I was educating my therapist on the one hand and then educating my family on the other hand. And I was just like, actually, I'm unraveling here and I don't even know whether I can take care of this baby. And here I am. So. I got a job. And... Was the was the was the can I, sorry was yeah, the, yeah, go was the taking away of the baby um, like a a real threat or part of your mental health issue? Was it a real threat back then? Do you know? I don't know that it is or it was, but my fear because mm. social services were involved and all I'd heard you know, at school, et cetera, social services got involved when there's trouble, you know? And so I guess it was a fear driven by my lack of education around what support services do or do not do. So I would say mostly it was my anxiety and it was mostly about the fact that I was a young mother and had no idea what I was doing, which, you know, most parents can relate to <laughs> in the first child. But then put mental illness on top of that and now you've got a perfect storm of fear anxiety then not being able to trust services not knowing what this medication was going to do for you not knowing whether whether you're ever going to recover because at the time recovery wasn't part of the mental health narrative i mean we talk about recovery all the time now and it's accepted that if you have a mental health struggle of course you can recover but you need to do a whole load of things to change your lifestyle but at the time 
once you got a diagnosis, that was it. You were going to live with that forever. And it was going to be hard, you know. And not only that, it sounds like your, you know, your Bangladeshi background said actually that only focused on the very, very unwell in society. So that, what was that word you had for it? Fagol, Fagol. Fagol. So yeah. Feigl would be someone who would probably be incredibly unwell and, and, and possibly not being able to cope with society. So that was the reference. Yeah. And so yeah. that was your, your fear. You had a couple like that, they're pretty big fears though. Cause I mean, like I've always, like I've always said to you, I thought I was going to be, you know, one flow over the cuckoo's nest and I yeah. can smile and laugh about it now, but that was a real fear. I felt that if I spoke to someone, they're going to pick me up, you know, and put and me in a straight it. jacket and zap yeah, me. Exactly. Wow. And I, I, I had my own version of that. That was, you know, essentially I was going to be locked up and nobody would be allowed to, you know, see me because actually there'd be shame on the family. There'd be shame as a human being for, for being weak, um, you know, all of that stuff. So, so, and, and actually a little bit more context is that my family have got, um, there is a number of people in my elders so that my grandma was pretty unwell with with mental health difficulties pretty much all her life her her dad was really unwell there's been there was suicide in that generation as well so yeah. there was a little bit of context in that actually so far everything that had happened in my family around mental illness was not good news so there was no frame of reference to say people recovered and and had a full life and it was it was healthy you know and actually also hearing people laugh at people so that the fact that we make mockery of mental illness and people that are struggling people that hear voices you know so all of that was just like why would you tell anybody that this is going on for you and how do you you know there's no context at the time about you're going to get you're going to be all right you're going to be all right nobody could reassure you that with that yeah, it's 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 still pretty silent postnatal depression and i remember meeting a, a a beautiful strong um policewoman who'd been through it and being a male i was trying to understand and she said jk can you imagine um waiting for this bundle of joy to come into your life and then she said at one stage i just despised my baby and actually didn't want it around. And just that feeling and that thought absolutely crushed me as a person. And I didn't realize that it was the illness. And she said, you know, to, and then worrying about whether the baby's gonna sense this, she said it was just unexplainable, you know? Do you know, JK, I still live with that guilt. So even this weekend, you know, hanging out, we went, um, we went and played um, uh, fun golf on the beach with, with, uh, to, because, you know, we're still in lockdown. So restaurants and things aren't fully open. So there's a few things that you could do. And we went and played golf with, with my daughter to celebrate her 25th. And there was moments I was watching her and thinking, I wonder if I did the right, you know, like there's so much literature and evidence about getting it right in the early stages and those formative, you know, the years of um, before the age of five and making sure that the child's got love and affection and that's really part of them building their confidence. And, and I still wonder whether I did all the right things and if I hadn't been unwell would there have been would she be even more confident and actually she's amazing she's traveled the world she's got a job she's just beautiful so so don't no so don't do that Poppy. don't <laughs> yeah, do that yeah. we're, we're preaching to the world not to do that so don't do that she's beautiful she's successful she loves you so but isn't it amazing how our brain works mm. you know and um, what would you say to to your younger self or a young mother that might be listening to this that's having some of those thoughts and too scared to to maybe share them or what what would you advise them to go and do? I would advise that I would say be be your best friend. If you were to look at a friend who was struggling what would you say you would get them help you would be compassionate 
and you would actually put your arms around them and say it's going to be all right this is just a moment in time and this is a period in time and this too shall pass but you have to support yourself and you have to love yourself and you have to trust that this is going to be okay that's what i would say and and the interesting thing for me is that it is okay it is a it is a moment mm. You know, it is a moment in time. It's the worst moment in time you ever want to go through. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think the strength that you you've you've gained from that be your be your best friend. I really love that. I think that's that's really important. And 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 what about some of the thoughts? What would you say to them? You know, how did you start dealing with the truth and the lies? And, and you know, you know, I often say, don't forget your mind lies to you. It will cheat you at times, you know, because um, some of those thoughts that I had, you know, um, I remember walking past a knife one day on the on the kitchen bench thinking, I'm scared I'm going to stab someone or myself or someone, you know, and when mm. it got explained to me that, you know, that's the illness, JK, everyone has mm. dumb thoughts and they let them go, but, a, but an unwell mind grabs hold of them and takes off, you know, what would you say about some of those scary thoughts? Yeah, I well, I think intrusive thoughts is such a that's one of the big that's the big part of mental illness, isn't it? It's that actually we stop being able to recognize what are intrusive thoughts and what are the thoughts that and feelings that we've really got. And actually, that's where the therapist and talking therapy really helps. Medication helps to sort of calm you down so that you can slow down that thinking process and beginning to feel again. So in terms of intrusive thoughts, it took me years, JK, of therapy to actually recognize um, my, uh, my demon, as it were. And it was one therapy session years later that we um we i actually drew what my my alter ego this this what my mental illness was and it was a great exercise because then i did it with the kids when they were little and we i i drew this monster and i gave it a name and what i was able to do is go okay this is the thought that i'm having is that my thought or is that the thought of my 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 demon and I know it sounds very simplistic and almost childish, but that was one of the really important practices that I was able to put in place in order to help me think through. Now it's automatic, you know, years of li living with anxiety and mental health, you, you, you start to actually understand and know yourself. I, I know myself so much better so I can go, oh, OK, that's that's you. That's not me let's let's park that for a moment and we'll come back to you later but here is what i'm thinking and that that is how i deal with it is giving it give, naming uh the feeling so self-observation and what is the feeling that that's going through my head what is the emotional reaction and what is my desire to do is it to just get out of the house and go for a massive walk? Is it to scream? Is it to send 50 emails instead of one because I get into micromanaging? So recognizing what my behavior is, what the emotion is sitting behind it, and then going, "That's this isn't, this isn't me, this is mental illness, or this is my anxiety, this is my depression. And then the third element of that is I always ask myself, how will I feel about this tomorrow? So putting perspective in place, how will I feel about this in a week? And how will I feel about this in a year? And once I ask myself those three questions, suddenly the fact that I've run out of milk and I want to cry <laughs> doesn't actually matter. You know, you suddenly go, oh, OK, it, when I put the perspectives question in place, this really is important and I do really need to give it intention. And I am genuinely worried about this or this is this is not really <laughs> this is distorted thinking so that's how i i manage it self-observation naming and validating it and then putting a perspective in place that is beautiful advice i i um so middle class white guy and i'm about to go cycling so middle class <laughs> fat white guy in lycra not a good look <laughs> not a good look but one thing that intrigues me is my nieces who are 
um, you know, my brother-in-law Samo and um, obviously my 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 sisters, um, you know, New Zealand Pakeha. Um, and she challenges us all the time um, about being generational racists or generational sexists or generational. Now, what she said to us is, is you you don't think you're racist, you don't think you're sexist, you don't think these things, but the way you've been brought up, it's not your fault. It's ingrained there and you need to actually challenge that, investigate it. It was very enlightening for me and I've been challenged myself and, and working on myself for a long, long time. But one of the things you spoke about was being was being in a, 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 from a migrant family, right? And so how... how how did that did it affect your mental health and is is your generation better at, at teaching your children or do they feel the same sort of pressures or racism or i mean how does that go from a mental point of view yeah i mean discrimination of any kind so racism gender discrimination discrimination against lgbtq anybody any anyone that is experiencing some kind of abuse or discrimination it's the intersectionality with mental health is like that you know like you when you, and i talk about belonging you know when your sense of belonging is disrupted and it's disrupted in a negative way, how can you anchor yourself? And you all know this, JK, like some mm -hmm. of the anchoring exercises that we do, whether it's in sport. I mean, I know that you you guys are in sport do anchoring all the time to get yourself in the zone. We always talk about, you know, rooting yourself, feeling your feet, grounding yourself, looking at the things around you. And how do you do that when the environment around you has made you feel like you actually don't belong here and i grew up in the 80s in this country and there was lots of things like for example uh, my pe teacher i was work wearing leggings instead of the pe skirt for netball or something i can't remember but you know it was that was common practice back then and she asked me to step out of the school photos for the school brochure because I wasn't dressed appropriately. I wasn't the right fit. And at the time, I remember feeling really embarrassed because she just said, you know, Poppy, can you just step out because this is for the school brochure and um, you haven't got the right, right clothes on for PE. You know, I was one of three or four Muslim uh, girls in that in 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 my year at the time. So again, real minority. But when you're telling someone to step out because you don't belong in that picture, because the school brochure wants to present something that you're not included in, that's a that's a pretty significant message to be given to a twelve year old. You know, and and I'm not going to use the racist words on this on this podcast, but you the p word you know lots of horrible stuff being said to me as we were walking past going to the library or going to the shops i remember my mom well, i mean my mom wears a hijab she's a practicing muslim um and uh i remember egg being thrown at her when we went to the library um so so i guess through through my as a young person i grew up with a lot of fear uh, a fear of being attacked in the street just because of the color of my skin. And what we know from all the research is the darker the melatonin, the more racism you're going to experience. So I still relate to what your sister-in-law is saying, your, your brother-in-law is saying, when your sister is saying, you know, I'm still privileged because I'm actually lighter skin than a number of my colleagues and friends who are black. So. I'm still privileged because I'll still walk into a room and get a better deal than my black friend will be will. So we all have to check our privilege. And I think the last year and the resurgence of Black Lives Matter has really raised the debate and put it back on our tables. I've got a blended family now. I've got two white sons and I've got two brown daughters. And actually, when we've had discussions over the last year around what, what it means for them, and their experiences. And actually, when you put the intersection of gender within that, you know, my daughters have a very different experience of life than my sons do. And that's both because of the color of their skin, but also because of the fact that they are women. So 
you know, when you're a woman, I mean, they're both at you don't live at home. I constantly check with them if they're walking home alone at night. And I don't check that with my with my sons. I don't check if they're working walking home alone at night. But if the girls are out at night, I do I do check that. Why is that? And that's because of the the fact that they're young women and actually they're brown young women. And I may be projecting my own fear onto them. And that's not good, but I can't help it because of the of the experiences I've had. And that's what we call passing down generational trauma. Not only do we pass down some of our fear because of the way that we the, the way that we're raising our children, because of our experiences, and we need to interrupt that and we need to change that. But in order to change it, the whole whole society needs to change to keep our kids safe. We need to adopt a completely different attitude, and that requires education. That re requires introspective reflection, like you and your family are doing. Um, privilege is something that we all need to check and that may come from being you know so i i'm a middle class woman i have a i have a i have a great job i'm financially able to create choice that's not a privilege that most of my family experience most of my family are still under earning under 30000 in this country in promise you know in jobs that aren't necessarily you know, going to be, uh, yeah, in jobs that, you know, hospitality in, in the lower, lower paid, lower status jobs. So actually, what do I have to do to make sure that those voices are heard? And what do you have to do mm. to make sure that we are bringing forward the next generation and not and recognizing the systems that perpetuate discrimination? and and we all have a role to play in that and I'll, I'll give you a quick example of one of the things that i did at the uh when i was reflecting last year on racism and, se and sexism particularly after the death of george the murder of george floyd lots of businesses put out solidarity statements you know the anti-racist statements but i thought to myself we could do that and cmha did that but actually what is my responsibility mm -hmm as a leader, what am I going to do? And I put out four leadership commitments very publicly. I said that whenever I'm in a room, um, and I'm very, again, like I said, very privileged, I, I'm in a network with 16 of the leading charity CEOs in this country from mental health organizations. Every, every day I'm speaking to chief executives of private sector companies. So my first commitment was when I'm in a room and there's a significant meeting going on, I'm going to ask who's not at the table and how do we make sure that those voices are at the table and the decisions that we're making in this group or in this meeting, what impact is it having on black and brown people? The second commitment was we know, JK, that panels and conferences are career progressing because they give opportunity like this for me to be heard. And that means that other people hear me. That means that I get invited to more. I'm going to be asking every panel that I'm on what that 50 percent of that panel has to be women or gender diverse, you know, the, um, and at least 20 percent of the panel has to be black indigenous or people of color so that in everything that i participate in i'm ensuring that actually it's not me and four black four white blokes which has been my career so far and i've not as a brown woman most of the time i've been really excited i've been like oh my god i'm in that room i'm on that panel and i've stopped thinking like that and going yeah, I'm here, but who else isn't here? And how do I actually question that now that I have got some influence, now that I have got some ability to be able to change the system? The third one is conferences. So whenever I'm in, asked to participate in a conference, I'm asking what's the diversity index of your conference and not the sideshows, JK, like who's on main stage? Because yeah. <laughs> usually the mental health thing is like a little workshop in the background and this is about something else. So it's what's what's the conference makeup? And the final thing is I'm saying to my team, every event that we're doing, every piece of work that we're doing, are we making sure that we're including unheard voices? Because it's not just about 
visibility and, and optics. It's about making sure that the work that we're developing is informed by diversity of thought, because that's what's going to make us innovative and ahead of time and fit for purpose for the next generation, because they're still experiencing racism. My daughters are still experiencing racism. Chantal Thompson, who I did a podcast with, um, beautiful Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander woman, very strong. And she, and I asked her a similar question. She said, okay, stop, you white guys, stop ticking boxes, employ them, put them around the table, you know, and said it in a different way, but basically, you know, and it's so true. So those mm. questions, because I think sometimes, you know, when, when like Black Lives Matter, I always come back to if it's meant to be, it's up to me. You know, what what can I actually do? Coming out and making a statement is is fantastic, and I totally agree with it. But actually, what are the actions? You know, so that, that I've been writing, I'm writing all these things down. So thank you. The other thing that really intrigued me in your story, and another another thing that um, a middle class white Catholic boy doesn't understand is an arranged marriage. I mean, would and this, I hope this is not a a generational racist thing to say, but did that influence your mental health? I mean, um, mm. it's so far from my life and my thoughts that I can't even imagine that. Well, first of all, I say I'm now three marriages on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it didn't work out for me. <laughs> um, okay trial and error to get to where I'm at now and I'm in a really good place now so that's probably the first thing to say do you know in my in my my experience wasn't even an arranged marriage so it was actually a forced marriage and I was only 17 at the time and do you know it's still practiced worldwide young mm. women you know you essentially I was 17 I was a child like <laughs> You know, I look at my 25 year old and I think, my God, like at your age, I'd already, I'd, I already had one baby. I was pregnant with another one and um, I had a national job <laughs> and you're playing golf. <laughs> 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 Love her. But that's the choice that we've, that's the choice that I've created. And I, that's really important. So I'm being, I'm being, um, you know, I'm joking, but it's really important to, from my perspective, to actually create gender equality and make sure that our girls have choice and they feel confident about whatever choices that they make, because my choice was taken away from me. And I guess that's why I'm so driven, driven about this I I issue. I think, you know, being married at 17 had a terrible impact on my mental health and particularly, you know, with someone that I didn't know. I'd met my my then my first husband once before I got married to him. And wow. <laughs> yeah. wow. Can wow. you imagine that? It's like a different no, world. No, I can't. That's that's my problem. I like, you know, I just cannot. And 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 you are like that's floored me. Yeah, but and the thing I'll say is, I, I was angry for a very long time with my parents. But as I became a parent, and as I grew up, I understood their frame of reference. And as I understood their frame of re reference, I became and saw them as two young adults doing their best. Actually, I was able to have compassion. And when I had compassion, I was able to heal myself. So that's really important to say, you know, they weren't horrible people. They basically had a cultural norm, which is you raise children, you find a suitable partner for them, and you organize that, that marriage, that relationship, and that's how things were done. It, they didn't actually know that there were other ways of doing this um, and they they didn't I guess feel courageous enough to step into a different way and adopting a different way of finding life partners so I will say that about my parents because I you like I said I spent a long time being angry angry with them and and it it didn't serve me and it didn't serve our relationships with them um, and so but the other thing about that was, you know, I, I said that I was growing up in this country and I was troubled. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't an easy teenager. And that came with that 
going back to that lack of belonging. So I was extremely, uh, you know, extremely incompetent at school. I was head girl, I was an A-star student, and I really wanted to go to college and university, no girls. Mm -hmm. In fact, not even any of the men in my family had gone to university or college. They just sort of finished school and then got jobs because they had to you know, survive, <laughs> they had to make a livelihood. So the fact that this young girl was all ambition was really difficult for my parents because they didn't know how to handle that. So they were trying to raise me to be a good mother and a good good daughter-in-law and a, you know, good family member, a good solid woman in the community and respectable. And here I was hitching up my skirt once I'd got to school and becoming head girl and one having ambition. And they just didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. And so one of the ways of, you know, and I rebelled big time, you know, I ran away from home, you know, I was, I was, if I look back at me as a teenager and think, my God, my, my kids give me, gave me such an easy time because I was a nightmare. <laughs> and my parents didn't know what else to do to contain me apart from going, right, actually, she's rebelling, we've lost control, we're going to take her back to Bangladesh and we're going to get her married because that will settle her. <laughs> and, um, and that's what happened. So... They um, went back to Bangladesh, um, found myself in a country where wasn't my first language, a culture that was completely outside of my frame of reference um, and in a marriage that I didn't want to be. And again, he was he was a nice guy. He was a nice guy. His family were a nice guy. There was nothing awful about the relationship itself, except the fact that I didn't belong there. I didn't, you know, I didn't belong in this relationship. I didn't belong in this uh, family. I didn't belong in that country, but I didn't belong here either. So you've got this, can you, so postnatal depression wasn't really postnatal depression, JK. I think it was a, a number of issues around sort of childhood, upbringing, identity, that all came into play with the birth of a child and hormones everywhere. And actually having the attention of medical professions, which probably was what led to the diagnosis. But I think my stuff started at 11, 12, 13, when I was trying to work out who the hell I was mm. and didn't fit in anywhere. And I want to get on to a really big one that you mentioned, like one of the probably the most stressful things you spoke about. So I'll, I'll, we'll put a cap on that chapter. And you are a superwoman, Poppy. You are a superwoman. You're amazing. But you spoke about work. Wow, if you want to talk about some scary stuff. So one of the things you mentioned and all these things that intrigued me, um, arranged marriage, you know, postnatal depression, but you actually mentioned pretty much in the same breath, your first job. Wow. So yeah. tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. So amongst, so the place that I found belonging was work and I'll I'll paint a small scenario for you. So I'm I'm sat on the floor of my council house, which is, you know, social housing with an eight month old baby. Um, and I'm crying because I don't want to live and thinking, how do I end this pain? And then at the same time, looking at this child thinking, I can't give you choice, like I'm on, so I'm in social housing, I'm on benefits, I'm earning, you know, I'm getting 60 quid a, a week, um, my parents don't really get me, I'm living with this guy who I've got no idea what he's about, <laughs> and he doesn't know what I'm about. And I had all of these dreams about traveling the world, and none of that's going to come to any kind of fruition, because I'm I'm, I'm pagol, I'm mad, you know, where is this life going? And actually, I just want it all to end. And I'm so, and she had, do you remember one of the, you know, did you, did you have the baby walkers with the kids? You know where you put them in that, yep. in a little seat? and then yep. yeah, the, the Love them. Would, Used to love yeah. them. Work that <laughs> kid in there, beautiful. <laughs> Let them go and that was it. So she was sat on one of those things and she came up to me and she, eight months, and she wiped my face and she gave me a kiss. And that wow. was a, that was an incredibly, and it, it chokes me now to still remember it. That was an incredibly powerful moment because it was at that moment I thought, wow, I need to, 
I need to give you a completely different experience of life than I that than than what I have had. And what do I need to do? And I thought the first thing I need to do is be financially secure, because unless I'm earning my own money and I'm standing on my own two feet and I don't need parents and a husband and society, like nothing is going to change. And then I got a job. So that's what I did. I got a job and my first job paid me less than my social benefits. It was like 55 oh, wow. quid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like five quid less. And, you know, at the time that was that was a lot of money, but I stuck to it because I loved going for the interview and I loved being able to describe what I could do for the organization and put my mind in a completely different place where I could compartmentalize all of this other stuff that was going on. I didn't have to talk about my mental illness. I didn't have to talk about my family crap. I didn't have to talk about any of that. I could just talk about that job. And actually it was something like 12 hours or something. It wasn't, it was part time, but it gave me routine. It gave me structure. It gave me identity. People were interested in what I had to say. I found that actually I was really quite good at organizing stuff. I was good at listening to people. I was good at relationships. So it gave me all of those things that we know are good for our mental health, connecting, giving. So having purpose, um, yeah, getting out of bed in the morning, getting dressed to go somewhere. Um, all of those things that are crucial to our well-being and then financial health as well. I had my own money and I could actually make choices as a result of that. So that's why, JK, I am so, so passionate about workplaces being healthy places. And the vision of City Mental Health Alliance, as you know, is creating mentally healthy workplaces and inspiring health creation. So not just being good enough in terms of preventing mental health, in terms of promoting mental health, but how does one come to work and go, this is part of my well-being toolkit. This is the thing that keeps me positive, drives me, builds ambition, gives me purpose. You know, that's the environment that I think if workplaces created that, goodness knows how many more women, how many more people like me would recover in a different way. Oh, it meant to me, you know, it's, it's really interesting. I, I steal a saying, and I've told Susie this, another um, amazing woman I've had on the podcast, and also she wrote a book about burnout, you know, and she said, it's no use trying to fix the fish if the water's toxic. And I think, um, but I mean, it's something that it meant to me we're incredibly passionate about. We think, you know, the new, the new, the new, future of business is going to be actually genuinely authentically looking after your people from a mental health point of view but how did you like you did this when it wasn't trendy so tell me tell me tell me because well-being's trendy at the moment and long may it last you know what I'm saying but <laughs> but back when you did it it wasn't so trendy so how did you come up with an idea that was so radical at the time when people are still hiding their mental health in the closet or not bringing their authentic self to work how did you go from the where you were to go okay gee it's the city you know the the city mental health alliance and then get these amazing people on board with you that were they like-minded or did you just beat them into it <laughs> you know what i love is that i always get the credit for all of this and it's brilliant and i should just take it but you know <laughs> it's not it was in fact you know it was in fact a bunch of white men <laughs> 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 No way. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it was, you know, our founders are, you know, Nigel Jones, Pete Rogers, um, Paddy, Paddy Watts. So these, these were three guys who were at the time working for Linklater's KPMG and Goldman Sachs. And they came together um, and they'd been talking about the, there was the financial crash had happened and actually the impact on men's mental health, particularly in the city, was significant. We saw a rise in very public and tragic suicides in the city of London back then. And these three men were talking about how to create a collaboration, a network around mental health and stress particularly. And 
our paths crossed. So I, I, I met Nigel, I think it was because I, I was running mental health first aid at the time. And I'd invited him to speak at an event for me because Linklaters at the time were running mental health first aid training, which was my then organization. And our paths crossed. And that really was the beginning of City Mental Health Alliance. And I just found these their discussion just inspiring to act and I it always been my ambition I'd remember walk you know getting a train and bus into London for work and thinking I wonder if we could ever get these big corporates to talk about mental health wouldn't it be great if PwC if Deloitte talked about mental health but I didn't know that I was going to be able to achieve that and you know sometimes I really believe in fate and I really believe in putting out there I believe you, in fate good so do i i think you have to be careful what you put out there but actually the opposite of that is be be ambitious be bold put some really big ideas out there and see what happens because it will drive you and it be, will become your north star and i think that what that's what happened for me was i was seeking out people in big corporations that would lead this agenda with courage and these three guys did and that we then you know talked about well what should we call it resilience and i was like no if we're going to call it anything we have to we have to reclaim mental health for what it is because every single one of us have mental health and they trusted me and we're still and we're still friends and we still work together all three of them are actually still on on our board or on the governance of the organization in some description and they really led the way because what they did was they spoke to their respective chief executives, their boards, their people of influence and went, come along and come on to this agenda. So we held a first meeting, I think it was, you know, let's talk about mental health, something like that back in, you know, almost a decade ago now. And then we formed a network called the City Mental Health Alliance made up of business leaders. And, you know, decade later, we're in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore. We've just had a round table in India. We've had two round tables in Portugal, New Zealand. You're very much helping us with the first round table that's going to be in New Zealand. We're, have, we're developing our US chapter and we're developing, I'm now separating out England from being England as well as the global organization and we're setting up global as well. So, you know, almost eight countries, <laughs> almost a global organization. And you know, something like almost 100 um, companies around the world committed to making the change. And the pandemic, JK, has been horrendous. But the mm. one thing that it has done is it's put mental health and health on every boardroom agenda. Every CEO has asked the question, how are you, with genuine curiosity. And that's landed it in the heart of business. And that's that's really our vision, putting mental health in the heart of business in the world. Um, and I can't wait. I can't wait to continue this work. I can't wait to have you down here in New Zealand. I, th I think they're interesting, like you're, you're not scared at calling leaders out and, and, and saying some of the things that we're saying at, at uh, Mentimere. This is the future. Um, you know, all the stuff that people talk about, uh, presenteeism, you know, um, absenteeism, you know, people are happy at work, they'll be more productive. You know, we firmly believe that. You you were quoted as saying from an organisation point of view, it takes courage to start a strategy that will outlive your tenor, tenor but paying it forward is crucial. What do you mean by that? If, if a business leader is listening to this, what do you mean by courage to start a strategy that will outlive you and paying it forward? What I mean by that, JK, is we live in a world of short termism. Yeah. So, you know, sure. it, I'm going to write that one now. Yeah. Can I steal yeah. that? You can nick everything like Beautiful. JK, if you're, if you're stealing my work, I am actually really honored. Like that is like I can't get a better um, compliment than that, can I? But short termism. So, you know, if you even if you look at Mentimere and if I look at CMHA, what targets have we got for the next six months? What targets have we got for the next year? And we want to achieve that because we want to achieve it because it's our business goal. But actually, as an e, e, we all have egos. So, you know, I want my tenure. So all the time I'm running CMHA, I want to be able to say, this is what I achieved. This is what the, the organization under me did all of this stuff. When we're talking about mental health, 
And you're talking about turning around attitudes and culture and stigma that goes back hundreds of years. You're, you and I aren't going to do that in our lifetime, JK. Like, we're going to get it so far. We're going to create a step change, but we're not going to achieve complete equality in, in our careers. So what is it that we have to do? We have to make sure that we start bold visions and we make sure that it's resourced and we make sure that we gather the best knowledge that we've got to put a strategy in place that's 18 months, three years, 10 years from now and know the fact that we may not be CEOs of our respective organizations, but what we're doing is embedding something that the next person can come along and they may well end up getting all the credit for it. And we've got to be okay about that. Please, please. We talk, I mean, uh, our North Star at Mentimir is to, you know, reach a hundred million people and save a hundred thousand lives. So, you know, there's no way that, you know, little old me is it needs everyone else so i agree with you i think sometimes and interesting when you're talking about that i was thinking about wow how you know how can i stay a bit more long term i think the other thing that that uh and and when you're talking about leadership and and putting this into businesses you, you you're quoted as saying ceos must apply their business acumen to this problem as they would any other major threat to their business if there was an IT problem costing businesses billions every month, they would fix it. Mm. So you believe that it is that important to the future of productivity and business and people staying well? JK, I believe it's that simple. <laughs> and, and that's the thing that I'm trying to get across with that is business leaders, you know, I mean, you're, the, the, that, the, that quote is from the PwC Global Survey CEO um, report that they did earlier this year. And I believe that when we talk about mental health, business leaders, you know, they've gone to the best business schools in the world. So what are they great at doing? They're great at developing businesses, putting amazing strategies in place, being tactical about what that looks like, making sure the board is measuring that and delivering. Just so see mental health struggles or mental health and well-being and psychological safety of your people as a business problem and solve it using business acumen because that's what you're great at when we when we go all like, okay it's mental health and well-being let's let's give it to hr and put an eap in place and maybe get a little bit of training for that team over there and and it's all sort of put into this side stream of work which isn't core business it doesn't succeed because you're not giving it the importance that it requires and we know that if your people aren't great you haven't got the talent that requires to run your business so actually make it core and people feel valued and when people feel valued people do great things so for me it's that simple it's not it's not a hr strategy it's not some side show that you bring in external people to just help you solve a problem over there it's a core business issue so who's doing a great job right now, do you believe, at that upper echelon of big business that would have, you know, a pretty big influence if, if they are going to lead because their peers would look at them? Yeah, do you know, I, 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 there's so many organizations that are doing great jobs at, at the moment. So we already mentioned um, PwC. I mean, PwC's green, green light to talk campaign is now worldwide and the green ribbon campaign has been adopted all over the world. And that basically, if you wear a green ribbon, you're given the green light to talk about mental health. It doesn't say that you're you know you have a mental health issue uh it actually is given permission and that where they launched that about four or maybe about five years ago and it just it just was absolutely brilliant way of getting everybody to talk about mental health but then alongside that they published people's stories and stories are really crucial to winning over hearts and minds so i would say pwc for me is up there london stock exchange another amazing wow. organization Mm -hmm. wow, they, that's train, cool. 
hundreds, they trained hundreds of people over the pandemic and, and we provided that training um, all over the world actually um, to get people skilled up and particularly line managers skilled up and recognizing the early well early warning sign. Deloitte's and their well-being movement, they did some amazing things around yoga, pet therapy, mindfulness, cooking classes, Spanish lessons. Linklatus, they reviewed all of their policies across Asia. Asia to ensure that they incorporated mental health and launched a free online um, a free online psychological service in Hong Kong. Latham Watkins, um, they have a new employee service called Connect um, Care Connect to address a whole person and actually incorporate counseling and coaching. HSBC trained um, all of their people managers around the world um, and are, are on that journey around mental health. So I, I could go on, but I think what I'd wanted to say is, yo, know, well, Bank of England is another one of my favorites. They, you know, the, the governor of Bank of England wrote a blog around mental health. During the pandemic, the last year, I think I did 28 events and about 20 of them were with members of City Mental Health Alliance and most of them were with their CEOs or country heads or board level people having a conversation about their mental health as, as leaders, how they have a conversation and recognize signs when they might have got it wrong and giving permission to their people to by by exposing their own vulnerability because leadership vulnerability <laughs> matters um but yeah i would just say that every city mental health alliance member in all the countries that we're in the fact that they have committed and joined like we don't do tokenism jk and i, no, I hope i can't imagine you do well, <laughs> i don't that's not no. something i ever thought about <laughs> come on a journey sign up to it we have we we as soon as you join we we do a thriving at work assessment which is checking 26 points of culture um, within your organization we give you a report we go right this is where you're doing brilliantly this is where you're not doing so great come and meet others that are doing really well in the in the cmha club community that and and let's learn from each other and that i think is the beauty of the alliance is some of these companies, or most of them, are competing in the market. But when it comes to mental health, we're all working together to accelerate each other's learning. And that's the only way to results, from my perspective, in the workplace to solve this problem. Because so far, there still isn't a library that you can go to and pick a book out and go, this is how you get this stuff right. Yeah. You know, your organization, my organizations, we're, help, we're making it. Solve it. it. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I mean, I. I... I'll probably get this wrong being a Kiwi, but their majesty, you know, William and, and, and Kate are always talking about it publicly, which just lightens my day because of, of people in such prominence, they are always talking about their mental health, which is very cool as well. Yeah, the Heads Together campaign, which lasted, I think it was three or four years in this country, made a massive impact in the general population's uh, narrative, language, talking about it. So making it, you know, commonplace to talk about mental health because, because the royals um, lent in and talked about it. And you can't underestimate the power yeah. of campaigns and people in, you know, significant people that are loved and cared for and popular talking about this in the right way it just makes such a big difference so i'm going to come back to you now a wee bit Aha, here we go so uh, you talk a lot about the five ways to well-being i talk about my daily mental health plan at mentor me we have six pillars of well-being and we always love to hear how our guests take care of themselves so we're, we are always lo looking for the greatest way for people to try and make sure they look after themselves on a daily basis you've been through it you've spoken to me about it tonight so i'm just going to ask you a few questions around those pillars so what do you do to chill what do you do to relax and calm your mind to be present um so to chill um i watch back-to-back -back series so i just you know i literally spend about 48 hours in front of a TV going, right, I'm just going to watch all 12 episodes in one go. That's that's what I do to properly Brilliant. Suit. Brilliant. And what about connect? What do you do for social connection? Um, 
postcards is one of my oh. I, I always have a collection Postcard. of postcards and because i've you know pre-pandemic i was always traveling and very busy and in pandemic we were in lockdown and actually i didn't see the kids in my family my nieces and nephews wow. particularly um so i i i never run out of stamps jk and i never run Beautiful. out of postcards and i'm constantly sending my mates like just stupid little things just a little note in the post that's a, and my nieces and nephews and that's what I do. And thank you for reminding me of my beauty, beautiful Auntie Betty, who's not with us anymore, because she always sent postcards. And when you said that, she just came right into my mind. So beautiful. What do you do? What do you do to be creative or hobbies or what are you learning that's new? Um, I am learning to sing at the moment. Wow. Um, not going very well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Not it's about not that. Good. It's not going right. And it's going to be a few years before I perform anything, but I am learning to 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 to, to sing. But I cook like you, JK. Nice. I like to put some loud music on, usually Hindi music, you know, popular 80s nonsense. And then I like to chop and cut and, you know, and, and create a meal that family can enjoy. I don't cook every day. I only cook when the guests are coming or when we've got nice. or it's a special occasion. Because I then get all the credit for like being a brilliant cook, whereas the, my husband cooks on a daily basis. But that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way for me to um, unwind yeah, as well. Yeah. What do you do to move? How do you keep active? Um, I like a lot of walking, so that's one of the things that I'll do. Go off, and 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 I think I said it earlier. You know, when I'm actually feeling like life is on top of me like i just leave my phone at home put a jacket on and get out and i do yoga pretty much every day beautiful how do you celebrate how do you foster a positive sense of self self-compassion finding the fun saris look at this oh, wow. I mean, and i mean you are in my fun room today so when i emailed you last night to go what what is, are we are we recording or are we this is a collection of about 200 saris and they are beautiful you look beautiful they are <laughs> beautiful you. and that's you know some of them are handed down from grandmother to oh, mother wow. to, and so they're every single one of them is a story and every single one of them is a piece of art and I just I love wearing them. I I love looking at them and all the different materials and learning about the different weaves. So that's where my creativity comes in. And this room in my house has been built purposefully just for my saris. And I know that's very privileged, but but it's what... also beautiful because you are retaining a culture. I think one of the yeah. things that worries me a, a, a bit is how do we celebrate and retain and keep our culture and keep passing it on so that's that's a double whammy how do what do you do to enjoy what do you do for self-care and give yourself something to look forward to i call it congratulations to me <laughs> um I, I probably come back to uh getting dressed up in saris and going out and hanging out with some friends when we can the other thing that i've i've started to do is uh, my husband and i've started to go for a sea swim it's it's freezing here like it's not it's really cold so actually when i say sea swim we sort of run in have a dip run back out like but that i found has been really really um amazing for just exhilarating and we did it on christmas and we did it on new year so that celebratory we it's we seem to be anchoring towards let's go and have a dip in the sea and just find our bodies again and calm our minds and see what that feels like so yeah what are you reading right now Right, I'm reading Rupi Kaur's Homebody, which is a book of poetry that I just think is brilliant. She's an Asian woman and speaks about women and our identity and amazing. And the other thing is positive news. So wow. I love this magazine. Um, I recommend everybody get it because there's so much tragic, awful, sad news out there. And I like to read positive news. It There's four, four a year lots of lovely stories about all sorts of things from around the world beautiful what podcasts are you listening to um i haven't actually got a podcast at the moment that i'm listening to jk but my daughters have said that um i need to listen to oh i can't remember what was it she was telling me about anyway i haven't got a podcast that i'm listening to nice. i used to listen to the guilty feminist which is pretty good 
what it's keeps funny. you awake at night? Uh, gender inequality. I think in the pandemic, the 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 opportunity to reset inequalities is huge. And actually, we've seen violence against women increase. And I think one of the stats I wrote down was that 53% of women with a mental illness have experienced abuse, uh, violence at, at some point in their lives. And I go to bed worrying about that most nights. So that's the thing that's keeping me up at night at the moment. What do you think is an open mind? Uh, one that's curious. So whenever I'm, um, uh, that's what I remind myself to do is when I'm listening with curiosity and not to respond, listening to, with to be curious and understand rather than respond. That's, that's, that's an open mind. Who should I interview next? I think you should interview Renee Ade Lodge next. She wrote a brilliant book called Why I'm Not Speaking to White People About Race Anymore. And Oh, um, I do need to speak to her. You need to speak to her. She's I I've she's brilliant and I've heard her um speak. Uh, yeah, someone that I think we need to learn a bit more about and from. You're brilliant too, Poppy. Any final messages you'd like to um leave for our listeners? Um, just to say, uh, be, be be compassionate to yourself and to other people, you know, listen and back to my very first message, you know, self observation is, is important, validate your feelings, be your best friend, and then put some perspective on that, you know, goodness knows, we all need to take care of our mental health. Now, and always, we all have mental health. So let's do a few little things like your 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 pillars, each day to keep ourselves well. One of the things I do for my mental health is I look for inspiration every day. And you have, Poppy, thank you so much. You have absolutely had me in awe, inspired me. And I, I think this is the fourth or fifth time we've spoken. And you do that to me every time. So I just want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your inspiration and all your hard work around this. And, and um when this when this COVID settles down, I can't wait for us for you to come down to New Zealand and and um, start the. I will, I will, and then I, then we'll reciprocate. And I'll come up and yeah, visit you. That sounds good. I'll bring my spices. I'll cook for you in New Zealand. You cook for me. We can have a few drinks. It would be amazing. Thank you so much for inviting me, J.K. And thank you for all the work you and your team do in this space. You know, we need to collaborate all over the world to make make the step changes that we're working towards. So I really appreciate everything you do.